Hi there and welcome back. So far we've been talking about medications that have a number of different potential general actions. And we started out by talking about the medications that had direct actions. We moved on to talk about medications that affected cellular receptors. And when we're talking about the cellular receptors, we broke them down into two broad different kinds of medications. The agonists, which would bind to the receptor and cause the same action as the endogenous compound. And we talked about the antagonist, which would bind to the receptor and basically not allow the endogenous substance or the natural substance to bind to their own receptor. Right now, in this portion of the course, we're going to be talking about the proton pump inhibitors. And when you hear that word, when you hear inhibitors or an inhibitor, it's going to denote an enzymatic inhibitor in most instances. And remember that the enzymes are proteins, they're proteins that catalyze a reaction as a really broad overview. Uh, the enzyme that we're inhibiting in this instance is the one that pumps out hydrogen ions or acid into the uh, stomach. And then adding a little bit more information about that, but still as a broad overview. What happens in the stomach, the way in which we get an acidic stomach, is to have a certain cell in the lining of the stomach secrete hydrogen ions. That's the parietal cell, and it actually secretes the hydrogen ion into the lumen of the stomach, and then that combines with chloride anion, and that becomes hydrochloric acid. What we're going to be doing with the proton pump inhibitor is inhibiting the enzyme that puts out that acid, that puts out that hydrogen ion into the lumen of the stomach. But remember that the point of this chapter is not to just learn about the proton pump inhibitors. We're going to be using the proton pump inhibitors to learn more about other medications and about a number of safety issues as well. You probably don't know too much about enzymes at this point, but for right now, it's enough to know that they are proteins that are needed for certain biological processes to occur in the body. And using just that amount of information and the fact that there are reversible and irreversible inhibitors of enzymes, predict the length of time that irreversible enzymatic inhibitors will be effective in the system. A, for the lifetime of the individual, or B, it would be variable depending on the enzymes and the tissues that are involved. And you were correct if your answer was that it would be variable, depending on the enzyme and the tissue involved. We will find out much more about this topic in the coming lessons, but the important thing to understand right now is that an irreversible enzymatic inhibitor doesn't mean that we're never going to have that enzyme again. In some cases, the inhibitor will be degraded at that active site, or otherwise the cell will replace the enzyme that is affected, as long as the cell that contains those enzymes has a nucleus. Remember, the nucleus is the place where we store our DNA, and we need that DNA in order to make new proteins. And this video depicts the first process that's involved when a cell is replacing a protein. This occurs in the nucleus of the cell, where we take a copy of the gene from our DNA that codes for that protein. After we've transcribed that information from our DNA, we can send the information to another portion of the cell where it's made into a new protein. So it's important not to think that when we irreversibly inhibit an enzyme, we'll never have that enzyme again.